So we're zooming in from space to a district to where is innovation created. And here I would like to invite two next guests. One of them is Anna. She is a thought leader from IBM in retail and in all kinds of other industries, but she's also been an entrepreneur, an intrapreneur, and an advisor to a lot of the interesting large companies in the world. So, Anna, please, welcome up on stage. Anna, ha have a seat, sit down. Thank you, I'll steal hey. 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 the next, uh, The next guy is the guy that actually took my job as the CEO of Result, but he's also the founder of Epicenter. So, Patrick Mesteton, come up on stage. You don't get any hug. Yeah. No hugs today, okay, thank you. <laughs> have, ha have a seat. Thank you very much. So, uh, from outer space to Regeringsgatan to Epicenter. What is Epicenter, starting with that? Yeah, well, Epicenter is a, is a place for companies to explore innovation. So it's basically for any larger corporation that is interested in setting up an innovation lab where they can test or run the latest digital innovation things, or for uh, companies that have a great internal idea and want to put a team to work on that idea. Or if you want to invest in a startup where we then can supply you with a great team of experts that can help grow that business. Uh, what it also is, it's a place or a home for digitally innovative companies that want to have that as their main office. But very much also for companies that are located elsewhere in Sweden or internationally that wants to have an office outside their office and that wants to explore this fantastic opportunity. So I think one of our driving forces has been if you put a lot of creative, innovative people together in a mix like that, we believe that magic can come out of that. And that's have been sort of our driving force behind creating this idea together with AMF. When does it open? It opens at the beginning of January. And as you heard, I think there's a fantastic offer here for some keys for a free month. Uh, so please check out our stage here behind and uh, come visit us. Uh, be happy to take you for a tour and show you around how it works. And you've been working uh, with, with transformation and digital in many large industries, but you've also been an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. What are some of the sort of key learnings from your journey? Um, well, we talked about the vision earlier on here. I think uh, it starts with attitude, mm -hmm. um, because I think very large, uh, a lot of large companies, it's about a different attitude to things. It's really about wanting to innovate, wanting to rethink, change, go with the transformation for the digital. And what are some of the things that sort of stops innovation? Uh, again, the attitude. <laughs> it's like us people, if I don't have the attitude and the drive and the passion to do things in a new way, I won't do it. It's the same with the companies. And I think it starts with the people, the right kind of people. We talked about talent. Uh, it's, it's you need to go away from the traditional corporate culture and processes, like you mentioned. If you stick with those, you will not create new. You need to decouple, create space uh, for innovations and thinking in a new way. No, because it's interesting, because the same immunity system that makes companies good and protects them from bad ideas also stops a lot of innovation. I, I would say so, because at the end it's about individuals. It's, it's not a company, it's people, individuals who have that vision, the passion, the drive to start doing things in a new way and push through. You need to be determined, you will fail, you actually need to allow to fail, there's nothing new w without failing. Then it requires again, people need to be determined and not give up. You're, uh, you mentioned space, you're building innovation labs. What is an innovation lab? What's the experience in an innovation lab? So what an innovation lab offers you, or as a member when you join us, I think it's a fantastic opportunity to explore different things. It could be a new idea you have internally that you want to sort of outside your normal immune system work with, and where you can get expert help and where you can get co-innovation support, a co-innovation exchange. Because we think it's super important that you can also work together with others when developing your idea. It's not the set business development budget type of project that you do with us. It's a completely different angle you have to take. It's, it's, it's a cultural change thing. You've also created a TV format. Yes, correct. What is that? No, so in terms of helping companies or, or facilitating innovation, we have a set of programs that we can run at Epicenter. One is, of course, hackathons. And we recently did a, a hackathon together with uh, uh, Samsung. I'm sure that's going to be presented, I think, later on in the program. 
where we did that also as an exploratory TV format, where we basically shot this as a, a reality soap. So we had teams competing on business development ideas, coached by a team of experts, having a traditional idol jury, looking at the in innovative things that they mm -hmm. came up with, but also played around with the format a little bit, creating tensions in the groups, uh, voting people in and out, and, and, and moving around, which I think is a fantastic way of also communicating your ideas later on. It provides a platform for companies then to broadcast and show off some of the inventory things that they do, mm -hmm. not only internally to their staff, but also externally. What, what, I, I want to, as an advisor in innovation, you're saying, you know, you must fail and so forth. But if you come in from IBM and you take a client on a journey and you fail, so, so what, what's the advisor's role in that? Not that you do fail, but you know, <laughs> how can you sort of be daring as an advisor and, and change mindsets of, of large companies? Um, of course, you know, you, need, you have always constraints, um, but I think it's... What I would say, the big companies need to establish these labs. Mm. You know, we know that's what all big companies do. So we can advise on how do you actually set up a lab? Yeah, yeah. Is it around digital transformation? Is it about the big data? Mm. Is it about cloud, mobile, all of these new cool technological technology things? That's one part of advising. How do you kind of separate from this old company culture and processes and set up and create a lab, for example, where you can in a sort of certain type of environment do the failing? and take the learnings. But what, um, some of the technologies, I know that you've created a big data machine called Watson, yes. and it can actually predict a baby's illnesses 24 hours before they get it. They can analyze the stomach and the baby, and then it says, well, uh, little Johnny is gonna get a cold in 23 hours and 14 minutes. And that's only the beginning. How can these kinds of technologies that you have be applied to innovation and industries? What are sort of some of the coolest industries uh, and technologies? Um, okay, let's talk about Watson, which is cognitive analytics. So basically, you load this machine with all sorts of data you can have, uh, unstructured social media, documents, pictures, videos, whatsoever you have. And one of the examples is, for example, North Face, sports clothing and equipment. Uh, what we've done with them is that uh, in the online, instead of, you know, let's, let's imagine I'm going to Patagon to, build, to do backpacking, mm. and I, I need some new gear with me, and I need a new rucksack. Instead of me going to the online shop and start searching and looking at the weight things and try to find the right product for me, you can ask, a just say a question, I'm going to Patagonia, backpacking, mm. and Watson starts going through the data and actually recommending you what could be the right type of rucksack for you. Is so that it helps type of, you to make a decision. Is that type of predictive technology, is that going to change retail completely? And how, how do you see that? You work a lot with retail as well, and we have a whole summit about retail that you're speaking on as well. I, I would think it will have an impact on retail. For example, in the digital experience, the customer experience, uh, the buying experience, even the customer service. When, when, so you're saying that mindset is both the biggest problem and the biggest sort of uh, prerequisite for succeeding. Let's say we have the right mindset. We're smart, but we're still not making innovation happen. What could be other things? I'm after obstacles that we could remove, or what are some of the other things where you usually get stuck? No, but I think, Ola, it's like, you know, working on those rocket solid abs that you work on, right? So you know exactly what you <laughs> what need abs, to do. abs, your stomach muscles. They are not mine, but I'm sort of looking at yours. <laughs> so uh, you know what to do, right? But it's still very, very hard because you have to have a you know, strict diet and you have to work on those crunches basically mm. every day. And I think that's very same for innovation. So a lot of people know exactly what to do. I don't think that's really the issue. I think it's changing the culture to really yield sustainable results. And there, there's a lot of obstacles around companies, I think, in the way that they think. It basically starts with numbers. If you look too much at the numbers, you completely shut down innovation, right? The other thing is there's a normal saying, I think, where people are saying, you have to follow your customers. If you want to truly innovative, you educate, you lead your customers. You don't listen to them too much. 
Because you oh, have that's interesting. So you think people listen too much to their customers? I think when it comes to innovation, I think it's great for your sort of existing product portfolio. But if you want to work with innovation, you have to step out of that. Because mm. you wouldn't have created customers for Uber if you would have listened too much maybe to the existing mm. ones. Mm. Or for Airbnb, because mm. you're so much into it, to, to an existing pattern. And I think things that are really disruptive and change is to do things, of course, out of the ordinary. So to take it for saying as this is what everybody else is doing in industry or, or, or this is how it is, those are some of the biggest obstacles for, I think, achieving that sustainable growth and really driving innovation at companies. Is there a difference you see in, in sort of in, innovative capabilities with the millennials and with older generation? And does that have to do with them just being younger or is there something different uh, do you, do you see that? Everybody speaks about diversity and so forth. There's a lot of things that you hear, oh, this is really the way to do it. But if I go to a large corporation, there's very few sort of uh, transvestites and 15-year-olds and senior citizens. They look kind of the same and they work kind of with the same thing from the same schools. I, I just want to hear your view on that. Is this bullshit or is it the way to do it? And how can you sort of bring diversity and, and youth into the innovation process? Um. I don't think it's an age thing. It's not a gender thing. It's not a cultural thing. It's not a language thing. It's really about you as a person. Mm. And I think the first thing is, uh, I'm not in a dress suit here. I'm from IBM. You, I'm supposed to be in a dress suit. Mm. That one is first, you know, to change your mindset and the way you behave. Mm. You need to change yourselves mm. as, as a people and as a company. Mm. And uh, again, it's, it's about... Um, what you said on the obstacles that I don't believe in this kind of approaches where a company defines an innovation process. No. We will define an innovation process and these are the steps we will be doing. Mm. Still we're doing it in the same way we do then with other processes. Mm. Mm. You need to forget that mm. and dare to try mm. and bring in the talent from outside with with bringing talent from outside, one of the challenges you need to tackle as company coming to the HR sort of summit here is if you bring in new talent, the hipsters or even the cool 50s, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, it's not the age thing. If you bring them to the company and everything stays status quo, nothing changes except a couple of new persons, they will leave no. because they can't leverage what they would like to do. So it's again about creating space and decoupling the sort of innovation from the ordinary. Mm. Uh, about youth, in the hackathon that you did, the, the TV show, you also had a group of you know, 12 to 18 year olds. How did they do when faced sort of with grown up industrial problems? To be honest, I think they did tremendously well. We had five groups and we had a, a, a group of, as you say, then very, very young children, I think between the ages of 12 and 15. And they tackled this subject and they did a fantastic presentation, I think, where they really thought about what is the potential of the idea that we have. Mm -hmm. And they were really, really great in framing that idea and also presenting something that's really tangible. Mm -hmm. They actually did a lot better than other groups. I was like, we're connecting the internet and the toilet and this and all that. And you couldn't even see your product at the no, end. Yeah. And the kids were very tangible, still very no, It was amazing. Fresh. A 15-year-old kid came up and he said, We've decided to tackle energy consumption in the connected home. We were like... Exactly, yeah. And we had, uh, I don't know if you, you, you remember, we had some years ago, we had Puck from Holland. Puck was then 11 years old on his third company, Puckypedia. I think he made like 110,000 in profit or something like that. Taught himself English online. Uh, he's coming back here tomorrow. Now he's 15. Imagine what he can do now. <laughs> but... Um, so, so, so I, I, I want to circle back to, um, to some of the, the, the coolest innovation areas that you see. What kind of technologies do you think will be groundbreaking? Or what, what are the things that we all will be sort of discussing here next year? I think one of the things will be the, the combination of technologies. You know, social, mobile, digital, cloud, data mm -hmm. everywhere, all over. It's how you actually combine them. Mm -hmm. And I think really about the customer first. And I think it's not anymore, do you have the mobile, do you have the digital? It's about how do you combine them and build innovative customer experiences. So it's really about seeing and hearing what the customers 
what kind of problems they have, for example, in digital with different services or products, not listening what they necessarily say, but hearing mm -hmm. from the big crowd of all sorts of insights and data. I think it's a combination of, in a new ways. Last thing, why are we so good in Finland and Sweden at coming up with things like this? Or why are we advanced in technology? And I don't want to sort of, yeah, we have broadband and we have those other things. Is there a specific sort of Nordic mindset that is good? I think at least in Finland, being a poor country as we used to be, we need it. Mm -hmm. It's a must mm -hmm. thing. It's kind of coming from a need to survive and also, you know, having this lot of engineering some sort of brains mm -hmm. for some reason. I think it's about the democratization of innovation, I think. And I think our countries are, are sort of leading and paving that way. It's very educated people that are socially aware, very talented, but also very open to other cultures and, 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 and sort of thinking. And I think not locking that in specific environments or just by some people is what's driving this a lot, I think, in Scandinavia. So I think when it comes to technology, we have a lot. I think the next is going to be really tackling the business models, changing that on the basis of the technology. We're going to, we're going to see business model innovation here. For instance, we have one, one of the, uh, the, the, the early creators in Nespresso, taking coffee bean to sort of a four or five billion dollar sales company. And, and a lot of the innovation I find sort of, it's boring. It's like now with lemon taste or something like that. And then others are like, looking at a coffee bean and creating a lifestyle, or they are doing something that's completely, completely different. How can we challenge our team to think a lot bigger? I think by showing good examples. I mean, there's, there's a lot of examples there from different industries that can unlock that creative. We talked about Airbnb, we talked about Uber, we talked about even Lego today. Mm -hmm. They're doing innovation through co-innovation by crowd sourcing basically. So they have 180 designers at Lego today, but they have thousands of people that comes in with a request for how to build a new Lego pieces. And what they do is they have a process for basically voting for them internally. And if one piece gets more than 10,000 votes, that's in the making. Mm -hmm. So there is, a, there is a way of working with those type of methods mm -hmm. um, going forward. So we'll see uh, more of both of you, and you'll be here. And uh, we'll be sure to come with our keys and see what you got cooking in Epicenter 1st of January. Absolutely. You're so uh, thank you very much. And uh, we'll also hear more from you at this time Retail Summit. Thank you very thank much. You.